Abraham, Avraham, spends a short amount of time in Egypt and becomes very wealthy while he's there. On his way back to Canaan, the Torah uses a somewhat interesting word to describe his journeys home. The sages pounce on this word to tell us that the word is being used by the Torah to teach us that Avraham was careful to stay again at the same places of lodging on his way home that he had used on his way down to Egypt. Why? There are various possible lessons. One is to teach us to be modest in our expenditures. Even though Avraham's income bracket had risen and he could have stayed at fancier hotels, he was frugal, modest in his expenditures, and so he stayed at the same places that he'd used on the way down to Egypt. Second, it's to teach us derech eretz, proper interpersonal conduct. You have to be worried about your host's reputation when you return to a city. If you stay with a different host the second time around, people may say, oh, the first host may not have been a good one. And you have to be worried about your own reputation. People may say, we know that first host was a good host. It must be that that guy wasn't a good guest. And a final possibility? Some say there was a practical reason. Avraham was too poor to afford the room rates at the inns on the way down to Egypt. So he had to rely on the extension of credit. On the way back, he had to go to each one of those inns to settle up that unpaid hotel folio. But one commentator cries foul with that explanation. He says it doesn't make any sense. Avraham was poor, but he wasn't penniless. He would have had enough shkalim or dollars to buy a room on his way down to Egypt. And who would have extended him credit? He was that wacky sounding guy always talking about God in a pagan world and about how God had created the world and you had to worship him. No one would have given him a free room on the promise that when I return from Egypt, I'll pay for the room. Sure you will, buddy. Many years ago, I was taking the deposition of a driver who had run over and killed a man whose estate I was representing. And so I asked the driver at the beginning of the deposition, what do you do for a living? He said, I'm a minister. I got a little worried. A jury could sympathize with a minister. I said, where's your congregation? He said, I don't have one. I said, so where do you minister? He said, well, I'm an open air minister. I go to subway stations and I set up my table and I put my Bible on top and my pamphlets and I minister to the people who walk by. So I said to myself, I don't have to worry. People are going to think this guy's wacky. And I hate to say it, but that's kind of like what Avraham was at the time, an open air minister. But he had it even worse. He didn't even have the Bible because it wasn't written yet. So if nobody would have extended him credit, what's the debt that he had to repay on his way back that caused him to want to stay at those same inns? The answer that this commentator suggests is as follows. Abraham's now returning from Egypt. He's flush with coin. He can stay at the presidential suite, at the Waldorf, or at the Four Seasons. But instead, he checks into that same Motel 6, or that same Red Roof Inn that he used on his way down to Egypt goes into the same bar at the same inn, meets up with the same innkeeper. Why? Because the last time around when he had a conversation with the innkeeper, he started talking about God, the one God who created the world and who you had to worship and who loves you. The innkeeper inevitably would have said, buddy, take a look at yourself. You're so poor. It doesn't seem like this God thing's working out for you. If God's out there and he loves you, why can't he give you a few more bucks? And Avram didn't have an answer for that. That was the debt he was going to repay because now he had an answer. Now he shows up resplendent with all his wealth, and he can answer that question. God is taking care of me, and God is taking care of us. To the extent he gives us wealth, there's a reason for it. We're supposed to use it to observe his commandments and to sanctify his name. It can be expensive observing his commandments. You have to buy a lulav and an esrog and a sukkah and a menorah and matzah. Women may have to pay more for modest clothing. There's all that extra fabric. A man has to buy a yarmulke, tzitzes, tefillin, and suspenders. And what about Jewish education? Tuition is very expensive. It can lead to tough questions, even fights among parents as to, to what extent to spend money on Jewish education, if at all. But if you remember that the reason God gave you that income in the first place was to spend it on that all-important Jewish education, the one thing that can ensure that the Jewish people will continue, then maybe it makes that question easier to answer. And to the extent God may not have blessed you with wealth, well, there are other definitions of wealth for which we have to be equally thankful. Here's a fantastic one from a Holocaust survivor. I looked for a rich girl. She has to be rich. Because? Because I don't have anything. So I found myself a rich girl. Rich, not in money. She had, thank God, she had a family, she had sisters and brothers, which I call it rich.